All right. Hello, everyone. It's so great to be here with you all today. Thank you for joining us. My name is Alice Lai, and I'm the director here at the District Manager group, Management Group in charge of K-12 scheduling solutions. I'm so excited to be here with you all to talk about scheduling, more specifically, how to strategically align your school schedule to your school priorities. I'll start with a quick overview of our DM Group mission, who we are, what we do, and why we are here today. So we were founded in 2004 with a mission to achieve systemic improvement in public education. We do two things, combine management techniques and educational best practices. And we define success as what's good for students, what's good for operations, and what is cost effective. At the intersection of those three things is our mission to achieve lasting results for students. We partner with hundreds of districts coast to coast to help address their most pressing needs in districts large and small and in rural, urban and suburban areas. Our current offerings combine management techniques and education best practices and are organized into four areas, DM learning, DM consulting, breakthrough results and DM schedules. DM Learning includes the District Management Council, our membership community currently bringing over 130 districts and their leadership teams, and offers exclusive access to resources and events such as these. Our institutes provide professional development to build district capacity in both cohort-based settings um, and coaching sessions. Our DM Equity Office partners with school districts to strengthen equitable and inclusive practices through our Equity Opportunity Review, Equity Advisors, and Resource Library. And we share our research in our signature biannual publication, the District Management Journal. DM Consulting partners with districts to provide customized management consulting support around topics such as strategic planning, special education, budgeting, and much more. Our breakthrough results teams work to provide coaching support to build leadership capacity while achieving measurable results around focuses such as increasing operational efficiency, improving early literacy, and reducing chronic absenteeism. And finally, DM Schedules is a cloud-based scheduling software platform for elementary schools and special education. As I mentioned before, my name is Alice, and I'm so excited that there are so many of you all joining me today to talk about all things scheduling. As a teacher and a principal who had to build the school schedule from scratch, I often think, you know, wow, I wish I had known all that I'm about to share with you all today back when I was making schedules. It would have made it not just so much easier, but more intentional. Now, you might be wondering why we are talking about schedules in December. The school year is well on its way. We're almost at winter break. It's a question that we get all the time, no matter what time of the year. Now, when you're thinking about when to bring up the topic of scheduling, scheduling well and strategically, we really emphasize, and I'm sure there's many of you here in the room, uh, the virtual room, who also realize that scheduling is really a year-round process. It's something that you're always thinking about, always you know, wondering, you know, how can I improve it? What do I need to tweak? What do I need to update? What should we refine? Even if you don't make actual changes to it until later. Now is actually a really great time to start thinking about goals and priorities that you want to incorporate into your schedule. More specifically, what are some of the ways that we can start aligning our resources and budgets to build the best schedule possible? So today what we're going to do is jump into scheduling and get into some ways that you can really make sure you align your goals and priorities with your school schedule. So in our work with schools and districts, oftentimes we hear about a lot of different pressures and opinions and voices on what should be included in the schedule. You can see just a few of them listed here on the screen. You know, there's teacher perspective, families, students, district leaders, facility constraints, budget constraints. At the same time, we often see school level teams jump very quickly to how do we build the schedule? What are the different blocks of time? Let's just start putting them together. This is a very natural reaction to focus on the technical piece of scheduling. We're all here today, however, to learn about a more strategic and effective way to approach scheduling. It's actually really important to take a step back from building your schedule to first consider you know, what are our school priorities and our goals when it comes to scheduling? Pausing here at the beginning can really help you lead your scheduling team, help you as a school leader or district leader to navigate some of the inevitable trade-offs associated with scheduling. So we have this saying here at District Management Group, uh, you know, you can schedule anything, but not everything, which you may hear me mention more than once today. 
it really does speak to the truth that yes, you have a limited number of resources, a limited number of teachers, and a limited amount of time during the day. When you have clear goals and priorities, those really help you navigate those tougher decisions that will inevitably come up in the schedule design process. So one big piece, just thing to remember today is start with your priorities and your goals when it comes to scheduling. To help us ground our thinking more strategically, here at DM Group, we developed a scheduling framework that you see here on your screen that really helps teams approach scheduling strategically. When we start with clear goals and priorities to drive how time is allocated, what courses we offer, how we staff, your schedule becomes an effective tool to drive towards and support your school priorities. For today's webinar, I'm going to use a secondary scheduling case study so that you can understand the situation the scheduling team was experiencing, see the schedule complications that brought them to us for support, and then feel the impact of a few strategic decisions and changes on their school schedule. So this is District A's school schedule. It happens to be a middle school schedule, but all the strategies I share today are very applicable to the high school setting as well. So you can see that this is an example of an eighth grade schedule. If I was a student, this is the schedule I would look at. There's lockers for 10 minutes at the beginning of the day, an advisory period, there's a couple core classes in blue, and then lunch, electives in the afternoon, and then this RTI intervention, you know, response to intervention period, kind of like a study hall at the end of the day. So just to give you a sense of the school, here are some details. Um, the grade levels were six through eight. There were about a thousand students. They had an eight period day. And then this is the context, the situation of the school as they were considering ways to improve their schedule, things that they shared with us. So they shared that their teachers were really struggling to get through content and weave in social emotional learning content in the 45 minute period. Um, the school had an interesting approach to incorporate SEL lessons into their 45 minute period. However, that block of time just wasn't allowing for enough time for teachers to do that. And it was leaving teachers feeling pretty frustrated. They also shared that the response to intervention period, that RTI period, the goal was to provide intervention at the end of the day. However, honestly, they shared that it just wasn't being well used. And, you know, kind of everybody in the building knew it, uh, but didn't really know what to do about it. And then finally, that time for advisory, they felt like it was an ample amount of time, 20 minutes during the day. However, they did share that teachers were really struggling with how to use that time effectively. So that was the situation at their school. Um, we're gonna dive into some of the initial discussions that we had with them around their priorities. So as I share their school priorities, I want you to start thinking through what your school priorities are for your schedule. How closely are they aligned or not aligned? You may have them ready to go, that's great. If not, that's okay too. This is the time to think through what they could be. So for this instance, this school got in the room and we asked them to write down their scheduling priorities. Now, anytime you ask six people to write down their priorities, you're gonna get at least six different ideas. So it ranged from things like all students should take a world language every day to all students should be enrolled in advisory. You know, staff should get common planning time. One person even said um, English teachers should get common planning time third period because it splits the day nicely. So there is a wide list of priorities. And if you actually tried to sit down and schedule all of these, it likely wouldn't happen. It's like what I mentioned earlier. You can schedule anything, but you can't schedule everything. So what we asked them to do next was come up with their must-haves. What do you want to be true for every student in your school? As a team, they took a second look through all the different priorities, and there were three that really stood out. The three that really stood out were, first, they wanted at least 50% of the day devoted to core instruction. The second was that all students who need additional reading support are enrolled in an additional reading course. And then the last one was that every student should be enrolled in advisory. These were their non-negotiables. This needs to happen for everyone. So the, remain, the remaining priorities became the nice to have priorities. When possible, students will take a world language. Most will get it, maybe we have some exceptions. Another nice to have priority uh, was that staff get common planning time with their department every day. The school worked really hard to make it happen, 
But if that was the one thing stopping those first must have priorities from happening, the school would reevaluate. Another nice to have was that English teachers have common planning time during third period. Maybe they would have common planning time, but it you know, could switch for one quarter. They were willing to let that be flexible. So the specific takeaway that we really encourage you all to consider here as teacher leaders, as principals, as district leaders and superintendents is to take some time to align your priorities as a scheduling team. Even if it is at the beginning of the scheduling process, simply documenting and writing down your priorities or your de facto priorities is a good first step. Maybe they will change. Maybe you will realize some are more doable than others and that's okay. But simply having this list at least at the beginning to work off of is really helpful to guide your work moving forward. So District A had the set of must have priorities. Our focus for the next couple minutes is to see how we can translate this schedule on the left into a schedule that reflects these must have priorities. So I'll give you all just a moment, take a look at the schedule. And if you were in charge of this school, what are some ways that you could potentially adjust the schedule such that it reflects the priorities on the right? So just take a few seconds, think about it, jot some ideas down and then we'll walk through a couple different ideas. Um, this is really just to build some time for you to reflect and consider how to schedule strategically. So we're gonna go ahead and dive right in priority by priority, starting with at least 50% of the day is devoted to core instruction. So whenever we look at a schedule, especially the bell schedule, we always start with the question of how is time allocated over the course of the day? So we examined the schedule and we organized it into the three buckets on the right there. Non-instructional time, non-core content instructional time, and core content instructional time. For the purpose of today, we said core content is math, science, English language arts, and social studies. Um, we know that varies on school context, district context. Some schools say world languages is core. That is definitely a district decision that I encourage you all to get clarity and alignment on. But for the purposes of today, we said these four represent core. Now, over the course of the day, we saw that 43% of the day is core content. In our research and our work with teams and districts across the nation, we've seen as low as 40% and as high as 70%. So there is a lot of variation. What I would encourage you all to consider as you look into that is to ask yourself and think, you know, it is a reflection of your priorities and your efficiency of your school. So when you calculate that number, is it aligned with your priorities? Are you surprised? Does it meet your expectations? In this case, they have quite a bit of the day devoted to non-instructional time, about 25% of the day. In fact, that's lockers, that's advisory. We could include this RTI period in there because as I mentioned before, they did self-report, kind of operated like a study hall. It was recreated with the best of intentions with teachers to pull students that need additional support and provide enrichment for those who um, didn't need the additional in intervention, but teachers didn't really have time to plan for it and students didn't know what to expect. So for that reason, we allocated it to non-instructional time. So we dug into that a little further with the team and they shared a few complications to the scheduled RTI period. You know, they shared that students are randomly assigned to a teacher during this time, and there wasn't a great system for that. So students were placed in the same classroom for the duration of the year. Um, they also shared there was no set curriculum for teachers to use to provide targeted support for students, where students can spend extra time learning, either previewing topics or reviewing objectives. Um, they also shared that students had to take initiative to go see the teachers they thought they needed help with. There wasn't a great way to track that. It was a lot of hall passes. So there was a lot of time spent by teachers at the beginning of the period trying to figure all that out every single day. So I see a, you know, that sort of resonating with a lot of people. Um, you know, We've all experienced this at one time or another where an idea for something doesn't necessarily come to fruition the way that we envision. Um, and they also self-reported that honestly, most of the students were using that time to complete homework or to relax at the end of the day. So there was some value, but people knew that that time could be much better used, particularly in terms of how they could potentially reallocate that time. So that's just a short description of their current practice that they shared. Now, the point that we shared with the team and that we're making today is really this idea of repurposing relatively small amounts of time 
it can really make a massive difference over the course of the school year. So one of the decisions the team ended up deciding to make was repurposing that locker time at the beginning of the day that wasn't used, um, that wasn't being well used. Um, and that sort of created a chaotic start to the day. You know, teachers and administrators felt like that if we just cut that time out entirely, let's just take that 10 minutes and repurpose it to instructional time, adding it back to core content time. So that's an additional 10 minutes each day, which plays into an additional 30 hours of instructional time over the course of the year. So in other words, one extra minute over 180 school days in the year is about three additional hours. So out of curiosity, we ran the numbers by teacher staffing and financial implications of that. Um, and in our, from our math, we sort of found that one minute is effectively about $10, a $10,000 decision for a school of 500 students and 25 teachers. So the idea here is that even one minute has a pretty significant uh, financial implications for how you can use your resources. And it's something to keep in the back of your mind. Um, you know, should this drive your schedule? No but it does speak to the fact that even a small amount of time adds up and represents a lot of time collectively as you think about your entire schedule. So when we sat down with the team to look at instructional time, we said, okay, we'll remove lockers. So you can see that uh, it's been removed at the beginning of the updated uh, eighth grade schedule. They decided to remove the RTI time and reallocate that time into the instructional periods. It was the same length of day. They didn't change that for a couple different reasons. Usually it's because it's a lot harder to change the start and end times than it is to change times within the day. Here you can see the updated breakdown of how those three blocks of time are represented. Um, in this case, we were able to cut down non-instructional time almost in half, quite a bit more, at, and quite a bit more time to core instruction, in this case, reaching 50%. Now, as a rule of thumb, there are some exceptions, but as a rule of thumb, we really encourage teams to aim for 50% of your day to be spent on core instruction each day as you're building your schedule. So if your school uh, you know, has a strong theory of action and a set of principles related to providing enrichment opportunities or SEL, then yes, that may change because you wanna purposely devote more time to these non-core activities. But it does speak to the fact that you should know what the numbers are for your school and how much time is devoted to core, non-core and non-instructional time to help answer our big enduring question, are we aligned with our priorities or not? So we have a quick poll question for the group. Um, you know, what non-instructional time could you use potentially differently in schools in your district? So I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll and uh, I'll share the results once we have uh, most people responding. Um, so just a couple different options period, is it passing periods, lockers, homerooms, announcements, advisory period or a catch-all intervention period? So about 16% of responses. I'm going to check the Q&A real quick. Yes, passing time between periods. So yes, that's another thing to also include in your calculations as well. Thank you for bringing that up, Ryan. Okay, so we have about 64% of people responding to the poll. Looks like we're inching closer. I'll go ahead and end the, oh, a few more. Here we go. We're almost at 70. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and share the results. So with about, um, looks like 69% of people participating, it looks like sort of a tie between passing periods or this catch all intervention period, study hall period is a place that could potentially be reallocated to other blocks of time. Um, so that's really actually really consistent with um, the, research and work that we've seen um, in our work with schools and districts, especially that catch-all intervention period. So much of the time um, is really, you know, teachers could do this or do that, but without a clear plan for how to really use that times, often we see that really as being underutilized. Thank you all so much for uh, participating in the poll. So now that we've made sure that 50% of the day is devoted to core instruction, we're going to think about how to ensure that all students who need additional reading support are enrolled in an additional reading course. So definitely a top priority for District A and maybe something that resonates with some of you all, um, you know, in reading or another subject like math or science. So 
You may be thinking though, Alice, you just removed the time to do that, that RTI period. Why didn't you just keep that? So our actual recommendation here is to provide targeted intervention to students who need it. So a student who doesn't need reading support isn't going to receive extra reading support. You know, you can see here that we've lengthened the ELA period from 45 minutes to 53 minutes, 53 minutes with some of those earlier adjustments, removing the locker time, that RTI period, but their afternoon is going to look like world language and electives. That's how a student who doesn't need that additional reading intervention is going to spend their time. Now, a student who does need additional reading support is not going to have the same schedule because those two students have different needs. Instead, they're actually going to have one of their afternoon classes become a dedicated reading intervention with a content strong reading intervention teacher who can focus on those students' needs. Now, if I can read the mind of at least one of you, I'm assuming someone's thinking, you know, but what if that's the only class that student showed up for today and you took it away? Abigail loves art and now she's going to reading intervention. And I 100% agree. If Abigail or whichever student loves an elective, don't replace that elective. One option is to let them choose which class they're replacing with reading intervention. We do not wanna take away a student's passion for school. Instead, substitute a different class that they may not have as much passion for with reading intervention while still maintaining their focus area. Another strategy that you can consider is, um, you know, this type of intervention strategy is moving away from a more RTI, open RTI period to more specific intervention model and making sure you create an actual intervention course. You know, we've been working with the district to really build out a new intervention plan and courses actually before the pandemic. Uh, we checked in with them this past fall and they said, you know, Alice, pretty much the only reason these plans survived is because our intervention courses had a course number, a name, and a teacher assigned to them. If we hadn't done that, it would have turned to, into, well, you know, I guess we can do this intervention, but maybe we don't have to, or teachers can figure it out, or we'll start it sort of halfway throughout the course, the, the school year. When you create actual codes, assignments for your intervention courses and treat them as you would a content class, an elective and enrichment class, it really changes the dynamic for how people see the intervention course for both teachers and students. So if you're thinking about this approach, my recommendation is to make sure that you treat the intervention course as you would any other course. Now, when we look at our third and final priority for what District A wanted to ensure happened in their new schedule, um, the third priority was that every student be enrolled in an advisory course. In their original schedule, it was still there. They had it at the beginning of every day for 20 minutes. Now, the headline here is that not everything needs to be changed. Some things can just be restructured. So they had that 20 minute advisory, but when we got into what it looks like, how, it is, how it's being used, it turned out that it follows what we call a typical advisory practice. The, these were full size classes. Each teacher had about 25 to 30 students they were responsible for. They were randomly assigned based on the first letter of their last name. Teachers were responsible for creating their um, own plans and activities. Uh, which with everything going on even prior to the pandemic was just a lot on teachers' plates, prepping multiple classes, then needing to figure out their own advisory lessons or activities. Um, if you ever Google advisory activities, as I have done as a teacher, it is a deep dive into an array of things where you can go and, you know, you will get everything from kinder to 12th grade activities, and you really have to search for something that fits your specific group of students. So because of this, uh, advisory can often become a type of study hall, um, a place where we make announcements, a place where teachers decide individually how to use that time. So we didn't wanna take away the time. We repurposed it and incorporated these best practices that we shared with the team um, from our work with schools and districts around the country. So one best practice is to ask students, who do you want to lead advisory? And open it up to anyone in the school. When we did a similar practice at my middle school, our school nurse and our receptionist were often one of the most popular choices that students uh, chose and requested. It was someone that students really felt comfortable with, um, you know, because they had built strong relationships with students. You know, one sort of pushback obstacle that we hear uh, from schools and districts is, you know, what about the teachers who don't get selected? 
you know, and that does happen. Um, and there are ways to mitigate that, you know, potentially uncomfortable conversation. You might have teachers pair up and share ideas, um, their mutual learning. You can have coaching and training around this. There's a lot of different strategies that you can incorporate to support this uh, best practice. Ultimately, if advisory is supposed to be a safe, comfortable space for students, making sure they feel comfortable with that teacher who is leading it is really key. Um, another best practice is providing advisory teachers with a menu of activities. So when I was a principal, we designated a lead advisory point person on each grade level. They planned the lessons and the act activities, shared them with the team a week in advance. Um, I've also worked with uh, schools where grade level teams rotate planning for advisory week by week. The point here is to make it an easy lift for teachers to execute and have a plan sooner rather than later. And then another best practice is to survey students on the effectiveness of, of advisory. You know, the, the school, their goal was really to increase the student connectedness in school. So the only way to really figure out if advisory is meeting that goal is to actually ask students if they feel more connected. And then finally, also asking teachers to share their interests and life outside of school so that students can get to know them as humans and build those critical relationships. So now that we've shared some strategies and best practices, let's outline the changes that we've made here as a whole. So we're gonna think back to those three must have priorities that we shared at the beginning of this example and reflect if we were able to successfully align District A's school schedule to these three priorities. The 50% of the day spent on core instruction, all students who need additional reading support are enrolled in an additional reading course um, and all students enrolled in advisory. So based on the changes we made with the school, we found that yes, at least 50% of the day is devoted to core instruction. This was done through the reallocation of locker time and that RTI time. And then we also found that yes, all students who need reading intervention are in reading intervention as opposed to taking an elective. The other point really to make about that is it doesn't need to be for the full school year. It can be for the quarter, the semester, on a six week cycle. As a school, you can decide the cycle when students can move on from an intervention course. It's another best practice that we've seen as well. And then finally, every student is enrolled in an advisory course and it's implemented with clear structures, roles and responsibilities and expectations to make it even more effective. So, when we take a step back on this, you can see that yes, there are different options you can consider when thinking about how to change your bell schedule and how time is allocated. So one is that you can eliminate like we did with the RTI period and lockers. Another strategy is to think about shortening different periods throughout the day, which we didn't do in this example, but it's pretty common. Another strategy is to extend time as we did with some of the core instructional periods in the schedule. And then alternatively, you can also maintain as we did with advisory. So with three of these options, you can really focus on the strategy of using time differently or more productively as with the case with advisory, where we made sure that time is really well used as opposed to previous school years. So if we take a step back even further from this, when we think about scheduling really strategically here at DM Group, we encourage schools and districts to consider the components we've captured here in our scheduling framework that I shared at the beginning of our time together. Now we spoke about two of these today, uh, goals and priorities, and also time allocation of how a bell schedule is set up. What's the breakdown between core and non-core? How is intervention built into the schedule? Um, we didn't touch upon it as much today, but you know, another topic that falls into this bucket is how is social emotional learning incorporated into the schedule? Sometimes that can be in ex explicit times that are separate periods or weaving things into the core um, instructional periods as well. Also two other big areas that we didn't touch on today one is course offerings, so which really gets into, you know, what ways are you providing rigorous opportunities for students in both an efficient and equitable way? How are you incorporating student voice and choice into the schedule? Um, this is re both really about relevant for both middle school and high school. And then finally, the last big component of our scheduling framework is thinking through this idea of staffing. 
what are the effective and efficient ways to schedule your staff, both to meet student needs, adhere to a teacher contract, um, and so that staff have the appropriate time and ability to collaborate as well. So I know that we include the word efficient here a lot in the schedule. It's not just to save money, although that is important, but it's also about using your resources and time and money efficiently to provide more opportunities for students at the end of the day, which is why we think schedules are a really important thing to think about as you think about providing equitable opportunities for students over the course of the day and the school year. Now, I know that was a ton of information. <laughs> My hope is that you're walking away with some clear next steps or ideas for how to strategically align your school schedules to your school priorities. For some of you, this might be enough just to get started when thinking about this coming fall or the year after. For others of you who might be looking for more strategic support and clarity into how to engage in this critical work, uh, coming up in this January 2023, we're hosting another Secondary Scheduling Institute. We'll hold your hand and help you guide your team to strategi strategically design your schedule. We'll share the best practices and research, proven strategies we learned in our work so that you and your team can hit the ground running and learn how to schedule strategically. It is a team-based approach. You and your colleagues can work together to plan and schedule effective academic interventions into your schedule. You know, how are you maximizing what courses you are offering? How can you prioritize and figure out how to best leverage your staff to meet the needs of students? We'll do this through three sessions where, where we'll go in depth into all those things that I just shared in the previous slide about our scheduling framework, goals and priorities, time allocation, course offerings, and staffing as well as individual coaching calls uh, with each team who joins the Institute to really get into the nitty gritty of what's going on in your building or in your district. You know, a few reasons we've seen people sign up in the past, you know, like myself and maybe perhaps some of you, you've never really been trained on how to design and think about creating schedules. You kind of just did it because they needed someone in the building to do it. Um, this is a really good formal structured approach and opportunity to learn about how to approach scheduling strategically. We intentionally set this up as a community of learning. So it's a cohort-based approach. So people from across the country can engage in the work together and learn from one another, share schedules, successes and challenges, and set up those points of collaboration. And then the last thing uh, is we know that scheduling is going to happen one way or another. We often find that teams really benefit from having a structured approach to thinking through some of these big questions associated with scheduling before they jump into the tact tactical process of building the schedule. Um, you know, one team shared last year, you know, before the Institute, we didn't know what we didn't know about scheduling. So the Institute was just a really great way to learn all those things. Um, so I hope that today gave you all a helpful overview of a few things you and your team can do today to start scheduling strategically, as well as a good taste of what the Institute is like. Um, my colleague Jennifer is going to pop into the chat a link to register if you're interested in learning more. And with that being said, we have a pretty good chunk of time left in our webinar today to open it up to all of you to pop some questions in the Q&A. Um, if you have questions about your schedule or sort of where to get started, I'm happy to spend some time um, just answering some of those questions uh, that anybody in the group might have. So Jennifer, if you could pop that in the Q&A and I'll check the Q&A and maybe our direct messages as well to see what um, questions exist out there. Okay, so there's a question around um, more to the course offering stage. So in the Institute, um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen for one second. Okay, so in the Institute, our second session is all about course offering. So what we do with teams is really help teams conduct an audit of your current course offerings, what's being offered, uh, what does course enrollment look like for those courses, um, what are the demographics of enrollment in each of those courses, what are the prerequisites, is that aligned with your expectations and your priorities and those pieces, and from that work, a lot of um, teams are really able to understand where some potential efficiencies might exist. Uh, for example, we worked with six high schools in Louisiana last spring, um, and the district, you know, really was just looking for some ways to increase the efficiencies on school campuses, and principals, you know, had shared, you know, we, we don't have enough staff, we need more teachers. And so 
through the course offerings enrollment sort of off audit, um, every school printed out the enrollment of every course and principals really discovered on their own where they had some opportunities to combine courses to then offer additional elective offerings to students. And so that was one um, sort of strategy and takeaway from the course offering section of our institute. Um, I see a question around block scheduling. Um, you know, it, it's around, so the school's currently working on a block schedule at our high schools, but considering going to a seven period day schedule, um, what are the benefits and sort of challenges of making a transition of this type? So you're currently at a block schedule thinking about going to seven period day schedule. So one thing that we really recommend for schools is anytime you are making a change to your instructional periods, the length of the instructional periods. Oftentimes we'll, you know, hear from schools or, you know, sort of share, we, we just switch from the block schedule to the eight period schedule, I, or the seven period schedule. I made the schedule, we calculated the times, we shared it with the staff and we said, go, why isn't it working? <laughs> and so the, the biggest thing that I can recommend is to really look at your professional development calendar for your staff and your teachers and build in some strategic planning time, set clear expectations for what those instructional periods can look like so teachers are set up for success. You know, if your block period is, you know, a 70 minute block period and you're going to a 45 minute or a 50 minute seven period schedule, that's a pretty significant transition for teachers. So you wanna build in some intentional um, professional development, have clarity around your expectations for what those periods should look like, and then also continuous support throughout the school year. Um, another thing that I would recommend if your schedule allows, what I always recommend for schools is if there's a way to test out a schedule change before launching it fully. So if you're making that transition to go to seven periods in the fall, if there's a way to try out that seven period schedule at the end of the school year after testing, then your staff can experience what that seven period day looks like and you can problem solve through some of the hiccups that you might encounter. So for example, when I went through a, a similar schedule change, um, we tried it out and what we discovered was our transitional flow in the hallway um, led to a giant sort of traffic jam and we had to adjust some of the flow for how kids were transitioning to classes. So that was just one big takeaway that I'm so glad that we did at the end of the year before launching the new schedule in the fall. Um, there's a question around priorities. So does the Institute support schools in creating their schedule priorities? Absolutely. So in the first session, we cover scheduling priorities. Um, if schools and districts don't have scheduling priorities, we have a process where you can brainstorm sort of the de facto priorities that exist when looking at your schedule. So oftentimes um, schools who don't have clear priorities will look at their schedule and realize, oh, we really value electives. Electives are incredibly important to us. We, student jo choice and voice is one of our big priorities. And so we have sample priorities that we share with teams. We support teams in conducting actually a scheduling audit. So as a team, you can really reflect and think through what are the benefits and challenge of your, uh, challenges of your current schedule um, in that process of sort of sharing those anecdotal um, takeaways. We also support teams in sending out surveys to your staff or to students as well, looking at your academic data to see if that also helps you understand your priorities as well. So there's a lot of support in drafting some initial priorities. And what we really recommend is, you know, getting clarity from the district up front if there's any specific district-wide priorities that schools need to build into their schedule from the beginning. So for example, a school we worked with last fall, as they started the institute, um, they didn't sort of have a clear understanding from the district if there were any district priorities. So when they went back to the district, the district was like, we're really moving towards SEL in a year or two. So really build in some SEL um, options and opportunities for all students into your schedule. So that was a really big, important district-wide priority that the school then built into their schedule as well. Another question we have is when does the Institute start? So the Institute will kick off on January 17th. It's a one hour kickoff with all the teams to get to know each other, introduce each other, share the scheduling framework, just to get your teams, your principals, your APs, your teacher leaders, whoever's joining your team sort of um, understanding what the purpose and the objective is from joining the Institute. And then the first session is January 31st. And so we have, we're pretty flexible with the kickoff. If teams need some more time to either get you know, financial approval from your district, sign the registration or sort of assemble your team, 
Um, there's enough wiggle room to at least get everybody started by January 31st. That's the first session um, for when we really recommend everybody to be joining by. All right, let's see, what other questions do we have? Another, oh, another great question. So there's a question around the flex block. So this is a really common sort of like popular trend that I hear from schools a lot. This idea of a flex block catch all period where it could be intervention and enrichment, kind of like that RTI example that I shared um, in the sort of um, case study that I just shared. And so what I would recommend if your district is thinking about how can we incorporate intervention, but also, you know, kids that don't need intervention, what needs to happen? So when it comes to a flex block, the simpler, the better is usually what I recommend for schools and for districts. And so thinking through what are the structures that you need in place to identify which students must be an intervention and which students are um, might not need intervention and can be an enrichment. So what we did at my school for this was for our flex block, it was three to 4 p.m. every day. I had my math and um, ELA teachers identify which students needed to be an intervention on a six week cycle. And we used specific assessments to do a pre and post test to understand when students were ready to sort of move on from being in that intervention portion of the flex block so that they could then enjoy join enrichment. For students who weren't in the intervention period, we structured it by grade level. So for sixth grade students who weren't in intervention, we surveyed them and asked them, what are possible enrichment activities that you would be interested in? So they do soccer, basketball, knitting, um, there was computer science, robotics, there was um, yearbook, uh, photography, we had a running group. So all students interest. Then we took those student survey results and shared it with the sixth grade team and any of the other adults that were supporting the enrichment activities for the sixth grade team. And then the teachers self-selected and sort of tag teamed. Okay, I, I used to run track in high school, so I'll lead the running club. You know, I played soccer in college, so I would love to do soccer. So having that opportunity for students to share what they're interested in, and then having that opportunity for teachers to um, opt in for what they would like to lead was a really great first step for that. And then after that, we solidified the enrichment offerings and then sent out a survey to students and students would give us four choices and we would try to give them one of their four choices. And that would work for, I would say 95% of students. There were typically about 5% of students where they didn't get their probably top three choices. And in that case, um, my person who's in charge of the scheduling for that grade level would go and connect with students and share with them what was available so that they could opt into something that they at least chose. So if you are interested in a flex block intervention sort of option, I would really encourage you to have some clear structures and systems to ensure that student voice and choice is considered as well as teacher voice and choice and then some clarity around um, cycles for intervention for when students are ready to move on from intervention, what are the data points that we're looking at so that we can ensure that they're where they need to be. All right. Um, I see another question uh, tied to common planning time for teachers. So we really recommend, we know that teachers really benefit from common planning time. There are typically three types of common, of common plan. So there's planning time individually, and then there's grade level planning time and then department planning time. Those are typically the three that we see. It is typically very challenging to have grade level planning time and department planning time without an early release day. It is possible, but it's pretty challenging. So if you have an early release day, that is one option um, to build in. Typically it's the content planning time that's challenging for high schools in particular, or grade level planning time to get everybody off at the same time. Um, but really what we see is, um, you know, having your electives offered for either your middle school or your high schools at the same time so that either the content teams can meet or the grade level team can meet. And then in addition to that, not just having the blocks of time, but having clear roles and responsibilities for who's in charge of leading that time, what are the objectives for what you want teachers to achieve during that time, um, you know, is there a leadership person that can be there as a support person or to lead those meetings to ensure that we're driving towards the school priorities uh, and pieces like that to ensure that that time is being well used. 
Um, you know, my first year of teaching, uh, we had grade level common planning time, but it was really open. There wasn't a whole lot of clarity around what to do with that time. So typically in my fourth grade team, what we ended up doing was just grading papers together and talking about things that we wanted to talk about. I don't know that that's really what the district or the principal set that time up to be. So I think having those clear structures and systems really benefit um, that time being used effectively. All right. So if there's any other questions, um, I know there's not an option to unmute, but definitely pop them in the Q&A. Um, you know, I'll also pop in my email into the chat in case there's ever any questions or you wanna talk more about any of the topics that I've covered today, feel free to email me um, and reach out. And I'm happy to connect with you and share more about what the Secondary Scheduling Institute looks like. Um, and the different types of support that we offer as well. And then Jennifer or Maya, if one of you can pop in the registration for the Secondary Scheduling Institute, that would also be great. Uh, oh, there is a request to go ahead and share that last slide again so that you all can see. So let me go ahead and share that. Um, just a quick overview with the dates and all those pieces. All right, okay. Oh, let me scroll down, more questions, awesome. Okay, so let's see, give me one second. Okay, scheduling, suggests, scheduling suggestions for a middle school and a high school that share the building and have the same schedule. So if I'm understanding you're looking for different sort of schedule ideas, for, they share the same schedule, so that's great. Um, oh, the, Give me one second. Okay, so sorry, lots of chats. So um, they the middle school and the high school share a building and have the same schedule. So that is a really great strategy in your district and a really great way to share staff. So one of a lot of our schools intentionally do that so that you can share staff between buildings, either elective teachers or some of those um, staffing um, positions that are harder to staff, uh, like robotics or computer science, those math and science pieces. Um, and then the other thing that's really beneficial when you have a shared schedule, specifically for students on an accelerated pathway in your middle schools, we really find that incredibly beneficial for students who are ready to take advanced math. So if you have an eighth grader that's ready for geometry or algebra two, having that as an option is a really beneficial piece as well. Um, and then also for any of your electives as well. So we've seen schools at the middle school level, especially if the schools are um, in the same building, having uh, students be able to take courses at the high school level has been a really great benefit of that as well. Um, okay, and it looks like Jennifer and Maya can't chat the registration into the chat. So I will see if I can do that right now. Okay, let me see if I can chat it. Okay, lots of screens and boxes there. Okay, that's the registration link to uh, the Secondary Scheduling Institute. Okay, there's a question around a set number or types of schedule models that your institute offer teams. So we will, in the second session, we'll share an overview of those typical models. So there's the eight period, the seven period, the AB, the block. There's a really interesting rotational waterfall drop schedule. That's kind of crazy, but really cool. Um, there's a trimester schedule. Um, so those are just the standard ones that we share. If you have a specific sort of request for what you're looking for, we have a wealth of schedules um, in our sort of data bank that we can share with you as well. So there's no set number. Um, and we actually, the biggest piece around the Secondary Scheduling Institute is, you know, we used to do a lot of custom scheduling projects where we would create the schedules for teams, we would share them with principals, principals would share them with their staff, their staff would then ask principals, you know, uh, Maya, how come I can't have my um, science class on Friday at nine? Or why can't I have my prep on Tuesday at 1 p.m. after lunch? And then principals would come back to us with those questions. And so our biggest philosophy, our biggest goal is to build the scheduling capacity and expertise within a school and within the district. Because we know that you all know that your community and the context of your school the best. We believe by combining that community knowledge, that content expertise of your context with scheduling expertise, that's really how you're gonna build the best schedules for your school. So in our work in the Scheduling Institute, we don't 
I don't create the schedule for you. It's more about designing the schedule with you that's aligned to your scheduling priorities. So there's no sort of set like Alice is only going to look at two schedules. You can send me as many schedules as you like. I actually love looking at them and seeing what's out there. And I'm happy to give feedback, um, you know, and thoughts around any schedules that you happen to share. Um, another question that I see is around, is the Institute tailored to the needs of our individual schools is, or is it more of a blanket approach? So to answer that, Todd, um, our Institute, the sessions, the three hour sessions with your teams in that cohort setting, we share sort of the best practices research um, that we've learned in our work with schools in sort of that holistic approach around, you know, here are the best practices for intervention. Here are the best practices for social emotional learning. Here's how you can conduct a scheduling audit. Here's how you can look at course offering, staffing, common teacher planning, how to establish an effective scheduling process, how to manage change in your district. And then when it comes to a more individualized, tailored approach that's specific to your school, that's what the coaching calls are for. So between each of the three sessions, so it'll be session one, then all have a coaching call with you and your team. You'll send me some thoughts around how your questions or what you want to focus that coaching call on. And that's where I will typically spend, the coaching calls are an hour long, um, talking with either just the principal and the assistant principal or the whole team, however you want to tailor that coaching call um, specifically to the needs of your school. So we had one school um, in Lancaster, Philadelphia, uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, their biggest challenge was their high school was in two buildings and they had 400 students traveling between the two buildings. So they had a passing period that was 15 minutes long, several times a day. So as you can imagine, um, that was a pretty challenging amount of non-instructional time um, that was being spent and where lots of fun, um, chaotic things were typically happening. And so that school's biggest goal was, Alice, how can we cut down the number of kids that need to travel between buildings so that we can cut that passing period down to five minutes. And so through our work together and three coaching calls, by the second coaching call, the um, assistant principal who's in charge of scheduling had whittled that number of 400 down to about 20. It was, it was pretty phenomenal. Um, we wrote a really great article sort of summarizing their experience that I'm happy to share with anyone who's interested. Um, but that's just a quick example of how we tailor our approach to the individual needs of the school. I see another question around, do we have a specific, does DM Group have a specific schedule that we recommend? So my answer here is no. And the reason is because it really depends on your district and your school's priorities. And to be honest, that's the number one question that I get all the time. Alice, what's the best schedule out there for high schools? What's the best schedule out there for middle schools? And there is no best answer that fits for everyone. It really depends on your scheduling needs. It really depends on the experience of your staff. It really depends on your district priorities. And so what we spend a lot of time doing in our coaching calls is, you know, I, I hear from schools, what are, your, what are your priorities? What are you hoping to achieve? What are your challenges? Okay, now that I know sort of the in, in sort of unique context of your school, here are some potential schedules that you might want to take a look at um, that might be a good fit. And so that's typically the place where I would make some recommendations, but never say it has to be the schedule because it really depends on your priorities. Um, okay, I see another question around, are there certain schedules that are more staff intensive, such as block versus seven period with staffing being such a huge concern? Is there a better schedule that is better suited to reduce staffing? So uh, the quick answer to that is yes, block scheduling is generally more expensive for districts. Um, it's more expensive to run and to operate. It's also typically harder to, or more challenging for most teachers to learn how to teach within, you know, a 70 to 90 minute period block versus a 45 to 60 minute period block. So if your goal is to reduce staffing and to reduce costs, I would recommend to sort of explore other schedules outside of the block schedule. Okay. There's another question around an A-day, B-day block schedule. Uh, we're exploring offering a more standardized experience for ninth and 10th graders, greater diversity of course offerings, career, have you supported balancing priorities that seem to be competing into opportunities for efficiency? So yes, so what you're describing there, Travis, is a lot of important priorities. And 
actually, I just spoke with another school last week. They're a technical high school and exactly with that, they want more course offerings, but also these career pathways for their 11th and 12th graders. We're really creating a lot of singleton courses that work competing against one another. So the first thing that we recommend <clears throat> for teams, in addition to establishing your like three to five max priorities, I really recommend three. If you have to go to five, go to five, but I would recommend three and then rank them in order of like importance. And then as a team really think through, okay, are we trying to do these top three all really well? Or are we trying to do number one at like 100% excellence and two and three sort of operating at like an 80% of achieving that? So I think it's important to understand as a team, if you're trying to do all three well, or if you wanna do one really well and sort of you know think about the other two as a little bit more flexible. And when it comes to these competing opportunities for efficiencies, one uh, some best practices that I've seen schools offer is if you can offer either a zero period or um, an after school period for some of those singleton courses. Um, we've seen schools also offer some virtual opportunities for kids to opt in to type uh, some type of self study independent study for some of those singleton courses as well. Um, and then also partner with other schools, either in your district or the local college through that dual enrollment process to offer some of those courses. So those are just some of the quick strategies that we've been um, sharing with schools as well. Okay, let me go ahead and scroll down to see, I went back up. Um, okay, I think those are all the questions. We have five minutes left. I'm ending five minutes early, which is great. Um, I really thank you all for being here and joining us today. I hope that it was beneficial and helpful. Um, the big takeaway is start with your priorities and your goals, and then really think through how to schedule as a team versus scheduling in isolation so that you can incorporate those perspectives. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Our team is here for you uh, for anything that you need. Um, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week and a wonderful holiday break, and our team hopes to see you soon.